Gary, one of the uh, co-founders here at Awake and uh, chief scientist. Uh, I guess by, by way of introduction, uh, prior to Awake, I was uh, one of the first two employees at Silence. Uh, depending on how you look at it, there was two of us there that, that first day in Stu's uh, unfinished kitchen. Uh, prior to Silence was at uh, NetWitness. I came into NetWitness via acquisition from uh, another company that, that had helped start um, that was focused on, I guess, what we nowadays call EDR, although uh, in 2006, you were either in uh, antivirus category or, or forensics, there was nothing much in between. Uh, and if we go far enough back, I got my start doing research and development, uh, working on the Dragon IDS for uh, anyone here who happens to remember that blast from the past. Um, but anyways, we're going we're gonna to jump right in here. We got a lot to cover in a, a relatively short amount of time. Um, so just at a very high level, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to cover, talk about the report that we published almost a week ago now, uh, very sort of high level findings from the report, uh, identified uh, about 15,000 domains that were tied uh, directly to C2 or malcode download or, or exploitative landing pages in a variety of ways, I'm going to show you, show you some of those things. Um, there were also covered in that report a total of 11, uh, uh, 111 Chrome extensions. Um, some of those extensions could do things that uh, certainly caught a lot of uh, investigators off guard that, that we were working with uh, in investigating these cases. Uh, doing, you know, had the capability to do things like take screenshots and, and read the clipboard and, and do some other scary things. We'll also take a look at that. Um, about 60% of the, the extensions we found in total were in the Chrome Web Store. Uh, those were uh, more focused on uh, collecting information and sending information out. Uh, the others that you know had the ability to, to especially take screenshots um, actually bypass the Chrome Store, and the report gets into uh, details and information on that. Actually, look at a little bit of an example of that here. Um, but in all cases, both the uh, really kind of you know scary examples, if you will, and and the ones that were. Uh, what we could call more intricate, the ones in, in the web store, um, just a mass surveillance. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the reach of this campaign was, was really surprising to see. And we'll kind of, kind of reference that as we go through this too. Um, also, what came out of this investigation was uh, uh, insight into an incredibly effective way of subverting uh, analysis by the security industry. And you know, what we saw was across almost all of these 15,000 domains, uh, incorrect assessments of them uh, across the industry. So uh, you'll, you'll see some examples of that, how uh, most all of them have, have been misclassified by classification engines. And so therefore, you know, firewalls that, that rely on those classifications uh, happily let most of this traffic through. Uh, sandboxes kind of incorrectly uh, labeling the activity associated with these things and uh, associated examples. The report is is quite long, quite detailed. Uh, so, uh, you know, what we're going to cover in this talk is uh, a bit of a, a summary across all the major data points. Uh, but there's uh, there's a lot more detail in the paper, and of course, if you have questions that are that are unanswered after both of those, uh, we're happy to to continue working with people to to answer those questions. So, here's a basic timeline of uh, we're going to go through kind of a basic timeline of of how this investigation unfolded and kind of some of the major findings that, that came out of uh, each of the major major milestones here. And so this really started actually, uh, I, I realized this morning, <laughs> almost exactly a year ago to the, to the day. Uh, so uh, this you know, June 2019, uh, we actually started developing some, some presentations to deliver to our customers. Uh, you know, as a sidebar at Awake, we, we you know, our business model is a little different. We don't just sell technology and walk away. We have very tight partnerships with all of our customers and help in investigations and um, you know write reports and, and and do things like that. And so you know, as we were uh, doing this work together with with our customers or or uh, other other partners, we started identifying a really large uptick in uh, rogue extensions, browser extensions that were ultimately exfiltrating data out, sending data out, and. We saw that you know at the time uh, a lot of this activity, most of the activity, fell into one of two buckets, and so the first bucket was what we were calling at the time the info to extreme activity. And so a few months ago, Duo Security released a really uh, good report 
on uh, what ended up being all of that activity. It's actually a fantastic report, so check it out if you're, you're not familiar with it. Um, but uh, what all of those extensions had in common, um, besides the way they were going about harvesting information and sending it out, was their C2 servers were all hosted in a single ASN uh, called Info2 Extreme. So that's, that's why we started calling that, them that. The other category, every domain, there was a lot of domains and just an increasing list of, of domains that were associated with them. But the thing that tied them all together was they were all coming, they were all registered by Galcom or through Galcom. And so, you know, that provoked us to ask this question, well, who is Galcom? And so we turned that around and we, we said, okay, well, what legitimate activity do we see out there uh, going to Galcom domains? And when we looked across the board, um, across different continents, uh, you know, different, different segments of, of um, you know, the market, different industries, uh, what we found was unless the enterprise had business travelers going to Israel, we saw zero legitimate traffic from uh, the vast majority of, of the enterprises you know, we, we worked with. So zero legitimate, legitimate traffic associated with Galcom. Um, but what we did find on the other hand that was quite concerning was we found uh, persistent footholds from these types of extensions going to Galcom domains in the vast majority of places we looked. Uh, not only you know, back then, but you know, through even, even to today. And so great, we, we noticed that. But uh, when we go investigate and start you know, working on, on reports and notifications for customers, as I mentioned, we're you know, very involved in, uh, we found that a lot of these domains, unless they were the, clearly the C2 domains, uh, a lot of them just showed up as parked pages, right? And so we'd see this traffic uh, on the network look very, very, very suspicious. Um, or clearly, uh, you know, sending data out that shouldn't be sent out. Um, but then when we go start investigating the, the domains associated, them, we just see these parked pages. Uh, or when we go and start querying, uh, you know, the reputation databases that are out there uh, and sandboxes, you know, everything's coming back and constantly telling us that, hey, this is low risk, no risk, uh, no problem here, like we see here. Um, you know, this, this domain is, is example sites. It's like Google or Schwab or Amazon. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking in, uh, you know, critical infrastructure, like a, a power plant or a, a chemical manufacturer or something like that, and you, you find this traffic that's, that's very unique to that environment, and it's unknown, you know, elsewhere, you think, ah, you know, this, this might be something targeted. But when you find activity that is so prevalent, you know, across so, so many different environments, and you go cross-reference and you see results like this, you start thinking, wow, what are we, you know, what, what what are we doing wrong here? This is, this is not adding up, doesn't quite make sense. Um, and so that continued for a little while until February. And so what happened in February was, uh, this was before shelter in place, so it feels like, um, like a year and a half ago now. But uh, in February, I was flying back from the East Coast. And uh, a lot of times I'll travel with multiple laptops. One is a regular laptop and the other I use for uh, malware testing or analysis and you know, things like that. So a lot of my analysis I do not, uh, not in sandboxes or virtual machines or, or in the cloud, but on bare metal. Um, and have a special configuration for that. So I was on this plane and I was doing some testing related to uh, related to this activity. Now on an airplane, uh, as most of you know, the bandwidth is incredibly limited. And so my test system is normally configured to uh, bounce its connection through proxies so that I never have to worry about uh, you know, coming from an attributable address of any kind. Well, on an airplane, your, your bandwidth is so restricted that I didn't want to deal with that latency of you know, additional proxies. So I turned that off and you know, just directly connected at least to the airplane thinking, hey, uh, airplane IP address, that's pretty non-attributable anyways. Well, great, do that. And the results were surprising. So I hit uh, some domains, you know, as part of this, this testing routine I was going through, hit some domains that I knew for certain were parked, at least every time I had interacted with them before. But now all of a sudden, with this direct connection, uh, I was getting completely different results than I had seen before. And so, you know, I started going back through this list of domains that were, that were organizing. And as I went through and started sampling domains, I realized coming through at least this airplane connection um, across all of them. I was getting totally different results. I was getting redirected to exploitative kind of landing pages like this or others that try to prompt you into installing browser extensions uh, and things like that. And so I thought, wow, this is you know, really strange. How do, we, 
how do we further validate this? So after getting back, uh, I started going to coffee shops or uh, you know office buildings with you know open open networks and things like that, and started testing to see wait do I do I see the same behavior that I saw on the airplane? And sure enough, what I found was when connecting through uh, a subscriber line connection. So the type of connections that people have at home or offices have, uh, like we see here, you know, DSL type connections. Uh, when you connect through those types of connections that, that you know, most companies have, uh, we get the, the redirect to the exploitative landing page. Um, now, this had never happened before. Like nine months prior to this, we had not seen this. And, what we realized was what we were doing up to that point was what I think most security analysts do, right? You, if you have a domain or something you're investigating, you turn to cloud-based services. So we run it in sandboxes, we run it you know, through reputation checkers, um, we run it through you know, URL scanners and things like that. Well, what do all of these services have in common? Right. I mean, you know, from reputation checkers that we see here on the left, uh, looking at this domain, yokungua.info, um, you know, to running it through VirusTotal, which checks it with you know, 75 you know, different products. And actually, VirusTotal also references a number of uh, additional reputation checkers um, and, you know, all these other services. What do these all have in common? Well, they all pretty much are coming from transit networks or data centers or, you know, the, the cloud, if you will. Um, and what we found as we started doing uh, testing across the entire data set was when you connect through these cloud type connections, always we would get directed to basically totally benign parking pages. I should, you know, mostly it was, it was these, these benign parking pages, but some type of benign, uh, some type of benign landing page. Uh, so here we see our example for youngkungua.info. Now, what happens if we take these exact same domains and, and just, you know, literally a few seconds later, connect from a subscriber line, even using the exact same computer we just used for the previous test. Well, here we see, before you continue to yongkongua.info, you need to, you know, you should go install this, this browser extension. Um, so a lot of times we get these, you know, browser kind of, uh, you know, prompts or these extension prompts. Um, there's also just a whole range of different types of, of exploitative landing pages here. We see an example of uh, you know what, what looks to be kind of like a uh, uh, you know the, one of these support fraud type type uh, uh, examples, but also uh, highlighted there in the upper left, uh, trying to nicely download several files and, and help us run them. So, anyway, it's just a whole kind of whole range of, of pages there that that we were seeing uh, redirection from uh, around a lot of these domains. Okay, so there as we get into the, the Galcon cases, uh, what we see is a lot of them, uh, a lot of them revolved around uh, redirecting users to these more exploitative type pages. Uh, a lot of them kind of revolved around these extensions that uh, were, were in the Chrome store. But there was also a second category of extensions. And these are the ones that I think were really attention getting um, as we started coming across them. And just kind of a, an FYI aside, um, it was really in, uh, since the start of 2020, and I'd probably approximate this around February to March timeframe. Um, what I'm getting ready to talk about here, we've seen a large increase in, um, which was you know, sort of interesting to note. But uh, what we see here is a different type of extensions that were being uh, pushed to clients. And these types of extensions very frequently came hand in hand with, uh, with executables. And so what we see here in the network traffic uh, on the left, it, or I'm sorry, on the right, is you know in, in line number one there, uh, we see an executable being downloaded from CloudFront. Then further down, uh, lines four and five, we see uh, .crx, so that's the file extension for extensions. Uh, we see those being downloaded from CloudFront as well. Uh, now, keep in mind, you know, extensions should really only be coming from Google and the, the Chrome Web Store uh, should not be plain text coming from CloudFront. So very clearly, this is an, an out of store extension. Um, and these extensions are uh, of the type that you see here on the left. Uh, so these are the type that are able to uh, read clipboard contents, but really more concerning, like you see uh, highlighted there, desktop capture. There's actually a variety of capture APIs that they uh, make available. And a lot of these go hand in hand. They're very modular. So like we see here, multiple extensions being downloaded. 
Uh, so we see different functions that, that get implemented in the different extensions. Um, and then they'll also utilize uh, executables to carry out very various functions. Uh, actually in, in our archives for, for presentations um, on our website, you'll see one of our threat researchers uh, gave a presentation recently, kind of talking about how uh, extensions have been involved in uh, even doing like active directory scanning, things like that, it's quite, quite stunning. So, so we see that here, great, all right. Now, this is what's interesting. A very big pattern that we noticed in this activity. And that was the executables that were most frequently associated with this activity uh, was install core. And so the paper, you know, takes a section to kind of focus on install core because it was so prevalent. Um, it, it was a big part of this 40% of the extensions that were being distributed outside the web store. And so uh, install core is a pretty interesting application. Most of the time you encounter it, it'll have very low detection. Um, whether the detection is low or high, it's almost always identified as a PUP, potentially unwanted program or PUA, right? Potentially unwanted application. Um, and, you know, so, so it's a very kind of effective actually tool I think, to be used uh, in, in these uh, borderline type cases, or maybe it's not so borderline as, as we'll see in a minute here. But uh, the, the types of applications that install core was being used to push um, and then ultimately generate traffic like we see here, um, it was uh, in a lot of cases actually custom rolled versions of Chromium that were configured to happily use these, uh, these extensions with all the permissions, uh, you know, turned on like, like a Christmas tree. So any other uh, functionality that they try to run, they can, they can go ahead and run uh, without user uh, intervention or notification. Um, and so, so yeah, we see that the, when the report references that, but getting back to install core, here's the interesting thing about it. So this is uh, from an analysis uh, sandbox run of actually specifically the install core binary that I took out of the previous screenshot. Um, and as you can see, it does things like install input devices and things that are you know, used for keystroke logging. It uh, has a variety of uh, sandbox evasion techniques and you know, looking for virtual machines and checking for debuggers and, and, and basically all the things that we as analysts think of as malware, not a pup, malware, right? Um, and so this was another kind of a pattern that started emerging um, over time as, as we were doing this and as we were interacting with uh, with our customers as we detected this stuff that uh, you know we started finding that I mean look so after doing threat you know, working on threat detection you know technologies and methodologies for for about about 20 years now um, it's it's my opinion that the the term pup the definition of the term pup has changed so it was about 15 years ago that I, I feel like we really kind of started hearing that and using that term a lot more and, you know, to me, the definition back then that most people, uh, you know, just you know, kind of in, implicitly assigned to the term PUP was, PUP was this type of application that all the examples that we had found of it were benign, but they implemented features that were very similar to what malware does. And so they were very concerning and, you know, people should know about them and they're suspicious and you should probably get rid of them. Uh, even though we didn't have evidence, you know, a lot of evidence of them being used maliciously, uh, you know, we just had, you know, they were popping up coupons and things like that. The way they were going about it was, you know, just not the type of software you want in the enterprise. Um, I think that, that, that it seems that that definition has changed, that that's not the case today. That it seems like the definition today is uh, PUP means this application, this software has been seen used legitimately before period on the sentence, right? Um, and the problem with that is when you look at a lot of security teams, they don't respond to PUP alerts uh, as, uh, you know, as, as that's the definition. You know, a lot of people think of PUP as the old definition that, okay, it, it might be suspicious, but we've never seen anything bad associated with it, which is very, very much not the case now. I mean, time and time again, we tested this uh, in, in doing this research. Uh, we found quite the opposite. So, um, so, you know, so that was something interesting to, to kind of note and pull out uh, of the report also. Um, and we'll kind of get into some other, other things related to that. So, so, okay, this, you know, this catches us up to, uh, to a few months ago. 
uh, at this point, we had you know a, a lot of data that kind of indicated okay, all the traffic that most all the traffic we're seeing associated with Galcom is uh, is malicious. Clearly, malicious or very high risk for for enterprises. Uh, how far down the rabbit hole does this go? So we turned around and we said, okay, let's get all the domains. So we, we went through who is and harvested all the domains that were currently registered um, and currently reachable um, that were registered through Galcom. And we went through and we did an analysis of all of them that ultimately uh, ended up in a huge amount of data, you know, like you kind of see summarized here. Um, and we'll actually look at this in, in slightly more detail towards the end too. Um, but what we did during this process was uh, we went out and we harvested uh, the basically every every page, um, every page associated with all these domains. And what we were looking for in doing this analysis was we we're looking to see you know from how JavaScript was using those pages, how much of it, um, you know what it was doing, why why they were using it, uh, how the you know, HTML was. Uh, utilizing various elements throughout the pages. We were getting into server, you know, versions and configurations based on uh, what we could infer from the way, you know, return codes were given to us, uh, you know, analysis of uh, hosting as well as name server characteristics, uh, as you can see, kind of getting down into cookie analysis and tracking elements that are embedded in the pages and the redirect chains, which were also very important and very informative. And as we are redirected through this redirect change, we do that same analysis on each step of the redirect. Um, and of course, a very uh, intense analysis on whatever that final kind of landing page was after the redirection. Now, we also had some data we could start with because we had nine, you know, about nine months of, of investigative uh, you know, data um, prior to this, so we had a list of known C2, defin you know, definitive known C2 servers, uh, servers or, or domains that were hosting malcode, um, those that kind of had these exploited landing pages. And so, you know, we had some data that we could use almost like in a, in a labeling sense to understand when we took the, the raw scan data and started clustering it, uh, we had a lot of insight to be able to understand those clusters. So we clustered them, and then after we had the clusters, we went through and kind of manually validated that what we see in those clusters, yes, are indeed you know more more of the same types of domains um, that were found through through this method. So very uh, very different kind of approach to having to go about uh, an investigation like this. I think you know for a lot of us, we're used to doing investigations where you have you know a, a few domains, maybe I don't know, maybe a dozen uh, or a few binaries, half dozen or so. Uh, but starting with uh, you know, a total of 26,000 domains and then trying to figure out uh, you know, how much of those are, are bad or, or not bad, uh, we had to take a, a very different approach in this case. So kind of some insight there. Uh, what we ultimately found uh, from the remaining 15,000 that uh, were associated with badness, a uh, vast majority of those, as you see here in the red, are tied directly to um, either the exploitive landing pages or the C2 type activity. Um, and uh, you know, malcode distribution, and we could reproduce. You know, anything that was in red, we could reproduce. We could show that yes, um, this is behaving the same way as the other ones that we we've seen before. Um, there's that thin band in orange there that uh, the paper kind of shows an example. Like certain ser servers, especially the C2 examples. Uh, were configured to uh, only respond if certain uh, header elements were in there and, and correct. And so in those cases, if we didn't have pre-existing knowledge of what header elements it was looking for, uh, we couldn't get it to respond, but every other characteristic of it overlapped completely with the other C2 uh, servers we knew about. So we knew that they were uh, definitely you know, associated. Um, and then in those other two categories, the medium and medium low, What's kind of interesting is even in the red uh, domains, what we saw was uh, the vast majority of those used uh, parked domain monetization platforms. So I'll just call them PDM, parked domain monetization. And so, uh, you know, in the cases even where they were filtering requests coming in, they were still making money off those requests, right? So by using these, these PDM platforms, uh, but then for the requests that came from subscriber lines, right? That could be an end user or a corporate user that got redirected through the, the malicious chains, um, you know, they, they went on a dinner, uh, different path. So what we saw in these bottom two categories were the exact same, not just the same 
uh, park domain monetization platforms, which do have uh, legitimate uses as well. But what we saw in these categories was they had the exact same signatures of their use in the uh, in the you know as we saw in the red category, so it separated them from the normal quote unquote normal kind of legitimate I say quote unquote legitimate use of these these uh, um, PDM platforms as well. And the, the difference between those two categories is whether we saw redirection or or not broadly. Um, okay, so so that catches us up now to to a couple months ago. At this point, we have uh, you know a list of thousands of domains here. Uh, we, you know, we have all kinds of details about which ones are used in C2 and how and the, you know, the, the kind of executables associated with them and, and then the others and the uh, extensions that were associated with them and the type of data that's being sent out by these extensions and how they operate. And so our very next step was to go to Galcom and uh, do you know, what we normally do as investigators, which is contact the registrar and uh, you know, start the process of investigating them together with the registrar to uh, get them taken offline, you know, take them down, black hole them, and, and do, the, do these things, right? So on, uh, back in April, which you know, now after uh, shelter in place feels like about a year ago, um, but back in April, April 29th, uh, was our initial reach out to Galcom, uh, called them, we used the web form on their website to submit a request uh, for contact, and then also, as you see here, emailed abuse at, uh, Galcom security at Galcom and support at Galcom um, and described, you know, hey, we have uh, many, many, many domains that we want to talk with you guys about. This is, uh, I think, an attention getting uh, number of domains um, and activity when, you know, asking about what, what the policy, what the process is uh, for continuing to investigate and further down. We're asking about who we should work with and, and how that should work. Um, we got no response, right? Total, total silence. And so we waited a little while uh, just to, to give them time. Uh, I, I know I can uh, specify that it's supposed to be 24 hours, but I mean, you know, not only does everybody get busy, but you know, this was also when the world was sheltering in place. So, uh, so we completely understand things could get crazy. Um, and so we waited until about May 8th, or I should say, about, we waited nine days, and on May 8th, um, followed up again, same channels, uh, you know, rewrote message, hey, referencing, uh, you know, the, the kind of earlier. Uh, notification and we want to see what do we do? Where do we go from here? How do we work uh, with you guys to get these get these addressed and resolved? Again, total silence, no response. So after that, uh, we decided, okay, um, this is really suspicious. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't support the case that, that Galcom's an innocent bystander here necessarily, but hey, we need to, you know, we need to kind of validate what we're seeing here. So instead we turn to Google. Um, uh, Google uh, ran their own independent investigation on this and analysis of all the data and resulted in um, pretty much all, I think there's a, there's a, there might be a couple that are still up, but uh, basically all the extensions that were in the report that were in the, the Chrome store, um, you know, violating you know, various policies of theirs and you know, validating the data and the port until getting those pulled off. Um, you know, one, one note that like personally I wanna make is uh, you know, I've seen a lot of the headlines kind of around this report and a lot, you know, Google's caught a lot of flack um, around this report, which, which is really surprising, I think, for me to see. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, you kind of referenced that Duo report that came out a few months ago. In parallel with that, Google announced, you know, new policies and uh, new processes to address Chrome uh, Web Store security. And actually, when I look at what happened with this report, I think it was a great example of them uh, delivering on you know, their, their, this kind of commitment to uh, Chrome Web Store security. I mean, this is exactly what happened here. They, they took the information, they were great to work with, um, they you know, did their own independent investigation and, uh, and, and took action. So um, you know, I, was, I, I personally was happy with that. Now, yes, I do think that there is a, an issue here that we need to be sensitive to, like we broadly, which is uh, business has changed, right? Enterprises are not buying licenses for uh, you know, physical software anymore. They're buying licenses for access to cloud-based uh, applications and services, right? Quite broadly. Um, and so what this means is that most of the business that, you know, most of the users in our enterprise do, or in enterprises do, have been consolidated into the browser. 
So that's one, you know, really big, uh, I think, issue to be sensitive to is that most business, most critical business functions now gets done in the browser. But the second issue there is, uh, you know, what you might think of as, as a bit of browser monoculture. I mean, the reality is Chrome does represent a massive portion of, uh, of, of the market, of the usage of, of browsers out there, right? So that, you, know, you put these, these two things together and from a security, from a defender's perspective, you kind of start to have to ask the question, well, well, what does it mean if the browser is the weakest link in my security posture for the enterprise? Um, and, and the answers to that are, are actually a little, can be a little scary, right? But, but I think that those are questions we, you know, reports like this, um, and, and Duo's reports and others that we've seen, others that are even referenced in this report, uh, really force us as an industry to, I think, ask ourselves a little more, uh, a little more honestly. Um, so, so there, you know, there, there is that. Okay. Um, now, we, we finished working with, uh, with Google uh, and uh, we, were, we were basically ready to release the report. And so as we were going through the kind of final uh, final versions of the report and vetting it with uh, various people. Um, there was a, a journalist who became familiar with it and asked to, you know, talk to them, asked if they could do a story, and uh, we you know, agreed to work with them. And uh, as part of that, uh, the, the journalist said, hey, I'm going to reach out to Galcom and, and see if I can get a response from it. Great, you know, good luck. Uh, and so uh, the journal sent a, an initial, uh, you know, made some initial calls and sent, uh, sent an initial email. And for that first one, he actually did get a response. Very generic, hey, uh, there's, you know, I, I don't know what, you, what you're talking about with this report you're working on. I've never, never heard of it. Uh, we work with law enforcement. There's no problems here, basically, basically is what it was saying. Um, and so the journalist came back to us and said, hey, what should, what should we do about this? And we're like, great. I mean, that was our intention anyway, is like, you know, let's, let's work with them. So uh, give, them, give them this contact information for us, you know, use this email address. It'll reach lots of people here. It'll get a, it'll get a response right away. Um, in fact, send them more data. Send them, you know, send them these lists of domains we have. Send them information. Let's, let's see, uh, you know, let's, let's work on this. And uh, crickets, no response. And so try it again. Uh, again, crickets, no response. So try it again. So th about three times over a five-day period, still getting no response. Uh, you know, we had to, you know, we had to, to kind of make the decision that, look, we've been working on this for a long time. This is information that, that really needs to get out there. Um, does raise a lot of questions that we as an industry should be asking. Um, and so, you know, so, so let's, let's release the report now. And so there was a lot of these, these kind of interactions that, uh, that, that did more than even just raise kind of our suspicion of, of Galcom's knowledge of, of what was going on here. But then there are other data points too, and that's, that's what this graph here is, is starting to show. So this graph shows the number of registrations made per day uh, through Galcom. And you see the big spike right there uh, is a single day at the end of December, if, if I remember correctly, December 26, it was somewhere around there, of 2019. So, uh, you know, about, about six months ago. Uh, in a single day, uh, more registrations were made than almost the previous year combined, right? And so think about this from a business perspective. If your business in a single day does more sales than it's done in almost the previous year combined, it's hard to imagine a scenario where you don't notice that, right? Um, and, and again, it happens again and again, right? In these, these follow two, following two spikes. Not as large as that first one, for sure, but, but these very large spikes that are large anomalies, uh, you know, from, from anyone kind of looking, you know, keeping, keeping track of business records and, and finances. Um, now, of course, we can say, you know, like it's hard to imagine that Galcom doesn't know about this, but the other thing that's interesting is, what are the domains that are in these spikes? And what we found is that the domains in these spikes are the ones that are being used both actually with uh, those scary types of extensions. In fact, we found them used quite heavily uh, in conjunction with the scary extensions, um, as well as the other, uh, the other uh, more subtle ones that we're kind of focused on the you know, information collection uh, you know, through, through the web store campaigns. So obviously these things are all tied. Uh, and, you know, at this point, we, we kind of have to go, go forward with this. All right. So that catches us up to about one week ago when, when, when we first, uh, first released the report. 
Uh, what about now? Where are we at now? Uh, actually, uh, this is this is this is pretty cool. I actually intended to do uh, live demos for this talk, and I couldn't because literally like thousands of these domains have changed at this point. So what you're seeing here on the left is the source code associated with one of them. Uh, with, from a request during some of our earlier scans back in March. You see the, the date highlighted there, March 14th. So uh, we, this is the, the, we see the redirection uh, and the, uh, the code that was ultimately returned to the client uh, as part of you know, one of these exploitative landing pages in there where we see you know, ActiveX objects being, being called and you know, the, the techniques they're using in this particular campaign group. Uh, and then what we see on the right is actually a request for the same domain made yesterday. And now what we're finding is that if these domains are redirecting, um, they really truly are redirecting to benign parking pages um, or you know, more benign advertisements. I was, I was seeing uh, ultimately getting redirected in, in testing you know, over the past couple of days to uh, you know, Amazon job listings and uh, advertisements to go visit Myrtle Beach and, and things like that. So, so this is good. Like this is this is a good thing. In in, in the course of a week, uh, a massive kind of exploit service uh, uh, surface area, you know, to the tune of thousands of domains has has literally changed over the course of a of a few nights. So this is awesome. Um, one thing that's a little curious to us. Uh, is also, though, in this time, uh, not just the past week, actually, if we go back a little further to, you know, the first, I think, really um, big uh, sort of disclosure of what was going on here was when Google started taking down, uh, you know, all these dozens and dozens of extensions. Um, you know, if we use that as kind of a, an interesting milestone, I ask, well, what's changed since then? Uh, we actually see that uh, 661 domains have, uh, quote, unquote, disappeared. And so what I mean by that is these domains are actively registered right now. So somebody owns them, um, but the IP resolution information for that domain has been pulled from DNS. So it's not reachable now. Um, and in this list of 661, uh, there, is, uh, there is actually domains that have a lot of overlap with what we were seeing in our earlier like C2 lists and things like that. Um, so there are some domains that we actually recognized as being interesting in certain ways in this list. Uh, but this list we made available, uh, it'll, it'll be available, I think there'll be a link to it uh, in the, the content that's, that's uh, released you know, following this, this talk. Um, there's actually a print version of, um, of this presentation and, and we put the link in there uh, so that all the researchers on the call can, can get that list and, and get all the data too. Um, and, and here we see on the screen that there's also a, a panda bear.org for, uh, for our good friends at uh, CrowdStrike. Um, might want to see what, what panda bears taste like. All right, so what do we do about all of this? Um, the good news is there's a lot of things that can be done uh, now uh, for, you know, for, for close to free. <laughs> and so uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things is uh, look into, if you're not familiar with it already, look into group policy management uh, of extensions. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of options available there. In fact, while we're talking about policy, uh, uh, corporate policies should actually ref, you know, talk about extensions directly. Uh, we, we tend to talk about executables and, and applications and programs, um, you know, call out extensions. They're, they're the same thing. Uh, and so, so you know, policy across the board, I think we can, can deal or, or address uh, the extension threat in a variety of ways. Uh, there is also, uh, Google makes uh, a few different tools available to, to manage these as well, Admin Console or, or Chrome Browser Cloud Management. If you're not familiar with those, look into those and see if those can work within, uh, within your stack there. Uh, and finally, uh, hunt. Uh, go hunt for these things. Like, Go look for them. Uh, this is really, really important, you know, and, and hunt, you know, there's, it's a variety of ways this word is used these days. Maybe audit is another way of calling it. it doesn't sound as good as hunt, but whatever you call it, go find this activity um, because there are multiple reasons why I think th these, this, uh, these types of extensions have become so unbelievably prevalent so fast. Um, 
And, you know, one is that kind of that, you know, that pup label that gets associated with, uh, with these and tools associated with these. But the other is uh, EDR has totally transformed the way a SOC works, right? Um, before EDR, really SOCs just had network data. You know, if we go back about 10 years, like they pretty much operated off, off network data. Um, there was antivirus in all these enterprises, but a lot of times antivirus fell under uh, desktop management teams or, or even desktop support teams like a SOC wasn't, you know, wasn't, wasn't really uh, uh, utilizing that data. Um, and so EDR created a whole new category of telemetry uh, and, and brought that, that data into the SOC. Um, but, you know, especially as, as it relates to browser extensions, browser extensions are a really hard problem for EDR, right? Because when, you know, if you're looking at processes and you're looking at process behavior, what you're ultimately seeing is the browser uh, doing things that browsers do that are allowed to do, you know, it's just in this particular context and where the data is going that 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 is really off. Um, and so great, actually, the network becomes a really powerful place to find that that type of activity. And so, so we have an example here, just a couple examples of the types of things to go looking for um, on the, you know, in this little, little screenshot here, we have a web request that's been dissected a post uh, you know, to config to this particular domain. And in the headers, if you're not familiar with this already, in the headers, you will see um, the Chrome extension tag and, and the actual ID of the Chrome extension. And so a really good, uh, good practice to get into is take that, go search Google for it. Um, you can actually take even, you know, this shows an example of just searching for the whole string without quotes. Um, really good to take just the ID by itself and put quotes around that too. But here, same result nonetheless. Uh, we search uh, Google and Google doesn't know about this uh, extension by ID. Now, if this extension has been in the store or is in the store, you will get results that point you to that extension in the store. So you can go examine it there. If you get no results, that means that extension is not in the store, either uh, has never been or was pulled out a long time ago or no one's come across it, but very suspicious to come across traffic in an enterprise environment uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, that you can't explain has some internal tool uh, and, and the internet doesn't know about it. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have some models in Awake that basically automate this. It looks for all this, this, uh, these, these artifacts in the traffic. Uh, we'll go out and validate uh, whether they are registered or unregistered extensions. And uh, you know, here we get a little example of, you know, we also see activity that's, that's going to a destination that is from an unregistered extension and a suspicious, uh, you know, probably potentially un uncommon destination here. Okay, so, uh, so that's one, one technique you can do. Uh, another is uh, look for, and, and we kind of started hitting on this actually in an example earlier, look for uh, extensions that are coming from sources other than Google. And first of all, if it's coming from Google, it's going to be in TLS, right? And so there's different techniques, different ways of addressing uh, that analysis, but you know, keep things keep things simple here. We'll look at the, the HTTP examples. So uh, look for the extension file extension, CRX. It's just a really simple way of doing this, uh, coming from basically any place. Um, here we get the example from Cloud, CloudFront. When you do that, um, chances are <laughs> chances are extremely high um, that what you find will uh, not be good. Okay, so uh, you know, to me, I think some of the big sort of high-level takeaways from uh, what is ultimately presented in the report. There's a, a bunch of detail all throughout. But when we kind of step back and, and summarize, I think the, the big questions that emerge from uh, what we're seeing in there, um, one is to be sensitive to, you know, the, I think the, the industry uh, has, has struggled with this kind of ivory tower paradox, right? Which is you have all these, uh, you know, you have all these technology companies out there creating security products, creating security solutions. Uh, a really important uh, group of people in a lot of these companies are the research team, but a lot of times they do their research, you know, in the lab, and the lab is not the real world. Uh, and so by doing so, it's very easy to get stuck, uh, especially over the past 10 years as we've moved so much of our technology and analysis to the cloud. Um, you know, it's easy to get stuck in that paradigm where uh, something like this, like doing all the analysis and making decisions in the cloud, which is not the 
you know, it's not in the trenches, it's not the quote unquote real world, um, can create a pretty massive blind spot. And I think that, you know, we see this uh, in, in the, the data in this report. We're not talking about one or two or a few hundred domains that some reputation engines happen to miss. Um, we're talking about many thousands that across the board uh, were, were pretty much largely, uh, you know, largely almost, almost intentionally ignored because, you know, as we come from the cloud, we, you, know, you, you get the redirections and you don't get, you don't get to see, you don't get to do deeper analysis. Um, so, so that's something to be sensitive to, right? If for the, for the, uh, for the IR folks on the call and the researchers on the call, you know, consider moving your operations more, more in-house as well. Um, and then looking for differences. Uh, here's, you know, I think another issue we kind of talked about, but, you know, just to, to reiterate, right, um, SOCs, they, like I said, they've been transformed by EDR and point telemetry. Um, this was, you know, this is, it used to be to get that telemetry, you had to deploy a forensics agent and, you know, the, 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 the kind of level of, of requirements or threshold to get those deployed was, was always extremely high. This is great. We just have it now. Um, uh, but, you know, as time has gone on, and I think more recently, uh, both we've had, you know, we're having more time to uh, learn what types of threats are better detected on the hosts or better detected on the network. Um, but now it's been long enough that, you know, the attackers are having time to respond to uh, the, the types of threats that we have become efficient at detecting in this data. Um, so a reminder to, uh, you know, to really hone, hone the network skills as well and, and make sure to focus on the network. And finally, uh, you know, just something for, for all of us to be, be sensitive to, um, you know, I do think that this was a great example of Google stepping up, not just in terms of highlighting their, you know, their policy and process updates, uh, that they've made this year, um, but seeing, you know, proof is in pudding. They, they came out and they, you know, they delivered in this case. Um, but like we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, it, it, for most enterprises, most of your business applications probably run in the browser. Uh, and so, you know, we do need to think uh, from a defender's perspective, what happens when the browser is the weakest link? Uh, and you know, I think that, I think for a lot of organizations, um, this is a question, you know, a question they're only starting to ask. Great that it is starting to be asked, but, you know, I think it's something that we need to be more conscious about and, and talking about more broadly as an industry. And so, uh, so we made it. We got, uh, we got a little bit of time left for uh, some questions here. Uh, do we, I, I, I saw some, some updates here. I wasn't looking at questions as they were coming in, but do we have uh, any questions I could start with? Yeah, thank you for that great presentation. Um, we do have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenter, please enter it into the Q&A window now. First question is, how about if the traffic is encrypted? How important was it to have L7 visibility? Uh, um, <laughs> nice. Uh, so, Okay, that's right. So uh, I guess a lot of the examples uh, in in the slide deck, and I'm trying to think on the report. I think a lot of the examples in the report too were uh, focused on plain plain text traffic, um, and I think that that makes it a lot easier to um, to kind of you know uh, highlight what's happening here and, and and these threats and and get a you know get a good idea of um, you know broadly across such a massive data set what's going on. But yes, absolutely. So uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a few of the, the threats we encountered were uh, only TLS traffic. And so, um, you know, try and, try and st stroke keep this, you know, pretty agnostic, product agnostic. Um, but I think when we get into talking about TLS based uh, detect threat detection, that, you know, there still is a lot of difference between uh, the way different technologies approach that. Um, for us, we have a variety of techniques that we actually use to um, do TLS uh, application identification. Uh, we have some, some talks now that are approaching a couple, I think a couple years old on this subject. Um, one is actually with SAN, so definitely you know, look that one up. Um, but to identify when, like say a browser has a rogue plugin on it, uh, the way that those models identify that automatically is, you know, first by looking for browser traffic, 
um, but then looking for signs of persistence uh, and uh, looking for that signs of persistence to uh, destinations that are relatively, you know, they don't need to be totally unique, but, but relatively uncommon. Um, also, you know, I kind of highlighted how you know, for, for us, we have some logic section called AVA, the Awake Virtual Assistant, which will do investigative support for you based on, on artifacts. So we saw an example of using the Chrome extension ID. Um, similar, similar type uh, uh, analysis is done with domains. So if you have traffic going to some, to some particular domain, uh, AVA has uh, quite, a, quite a few tricks up her sleeve in terms of uh, um, being able to figure out if, uh, if that domain is legitimate or uh, or suspicious or malicious, and so uh, so long story short is no. In fact, because of what I was just describing, um, in especially in the non-browser examples, you know, a lot of times we detect uh, compromises, we detect malware because TLS is being used. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, this actually does apply to this. Um, in those custom, when we found the custom rolled versions of Chromium. That uh, you know that that weren't being used elsewhere in the enterprise that ended up generating you know very unique TLS fingerprints um, associated with traffic uh, to to other domains and so uh, we were able to to you know zero in on that you know, that way as well. But uh, long story short is uh, there are there are a variety of ways for for dealing with TLS based threats. Um, it, it is uh, you know for I, I think unfortunately you know at this point in time um, it is very product specific though. Okay, great, thank you. Next question is, you recommended hunting for this behavior and not ignoring it, but how do I hunt for it? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> there, I guess there could be, could be some depth to that too. Uh, first of all, full packet capture. I mean, like, look, uh, hunting, uh, let's, let's kind of define what we mean by hunting, right? It, so, Hunting is, uh, in, in, you know, sometimes people refer to it as a proactive investigation instead of waiting for a, a notification that you have a compromise. Um, it's doing an investigation, um, just assuming that there's one in there and then you know, seeing what comes of, of that effort. Um, hunting and, you know, to me, you know, as, as I'm thinking about this, right, I also tend to, th you know, a lot of times people tend to think of hunting and uh, and not like alert analysis and investigation as very different things. Um, but I'd throw out that actually, I don't think that they are. I think they are uh, intimately linked. That uh, hunting and alert investigation are kind of the same thing, except that in alert investigation, you have a starting point. You have an alert or you have you know, some external notification or tap on the shoulder or whatever it may be. Um, and in the hunting case, you don't. You're just working to generate that initial starting point. Um, but, but you know, if you find something that's, that's quote unquote interesting, then the workflow ends up, ends up being the same, right? Um, but to, to generate that, so you know, a lot of times when you have an alert that's generated, you, know, you think about the products that are, are generating those alerts. They have a bunch of raw data, they crunch it down, however, you know, through whatever techniques they're gonna use, um, and then they generate the alert and save the relevant data and discard the rest. So, to do that initial alert generation, you need the raw data, right? You need it all. So, so that's why I say, you know, if we're talking about the network, full packet capture, unquestionably. I mean, hunting didn't really exist on the endpoint, except for, you know, I think a few kind of really sort of high profile outlets like Mandiant who had their own technologies to uh, broadly deploy uh, probably a tool that basically had full forensic capability because that's what's required to hunt. You need the full, full telemetry, all the data. Um, so same applies to the network. Uh, starting point is uh, full pack capture. And then, you know, where you go from there uh, depends on, well, it depends on a variety of factors. Uh, you know, for, for, uh, for us, I'm, again, I'm trying, I'm trying to be agnostic here. I'll throw out a, an open source tool in a second. Uh, but, uh, you know, for us, right, it's not just about, hey, here's, here's a platform that's available for, for, for hunting on. Um, ultimately, you look at technologies like this because you want automated detection and you need automated detection for this. There's too much data for us to rely on people to, to always handle. Um, 
And so, you know, for us, that detection is actually, you know, a lot of it's based on, you know, data science and other techniques, but uh, a lot of it is based on models that are uh, really embody what a hunter has done in the past successfully to find particular types of, of bad activity. And we save it in, uh, you know, in a series of steps. So it's, it's almost like you can almost think of, you know, a lot of our models like SOAR in a way over uh, forensic data. Um, Okay, so uh, so ultimately, I think to to hunt right, you need to, and the reason I say all this is, you know, what we're getting at here is you need to be able to get to the values, you need to be able to get to the raw data, um, where you get this information about like the browser extensions that that may be there, um, or being able to see the data that's being sent out, so you can assess, you know, not just get some flow data that says, hey. Uh, there was this tiny upload from, you know, the client to this server, but you can go look at, which, I mean, this happens frequently, especially uh, for software that, uh, you know, kind of runs in the background and, and does updates. Updaters do this a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, the ability to get in and look at the data and go, ah, yes, wait a minute. I see, I see URLs. I see history being sent out. I see URLs that show my internal uh, application structure. Um, and in fact, we've uh, we've had some other enterprises turn around based on uh, based on the hunts we've done and based on the things we've identified. They've come back and said, "Wow, you know, we've been targeted with some spear phishing campaigns where they had really intimate knowledge of our internal application structures, and we've been struggling to figure out, you know, if there isn't an insider telling them these, you know, these paths and these structures. Like we have no idea how they've been figuring this out." Um, and then, you know, through these hunting exercises and looking at extensions a lot where we see their harvesting history and cookies and things like that and sending those out. There it is. There's the, the there we see that the information being sent out to, to these, you know, these, these, uh, you know, totally unattributable uh, sources or destinations, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, so kind of a, a, a windy road there through the answer. Um, but uh, yeah, oh, I, I promise an open source. If you're not familiar already, uh, Moloch, you know, is a, is a uh, is an open source uh, full pack capture system. Um, you know, totally totally fair place to start. Um, there are there are other technologies out there that do uh, that do full pack capture. You know, the thing that kind of separates them all is the levels of analytics that ride on top of that. Uh, you know, which in turn dictate you know how how much of the work with that tool is going to be manual versus you know totally. You know, automated or, or even totally automated. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this is more of a comment um, before we go into the next question. A lot of audience members were um, coming, we did see a lot with a lot of similar questions that were coming in, um, wanting the list of the extensions and domains and et cetera. And to view that, you can actually scroll in through the chat window where we have posted those links for you to view um, as we're going on with this next question is, are seams up to date with these kind of threats? Uh, um, uh, yeah, okay, so I, I'm him and Han on this one because it, just internally this morning, uh, we, we were having a discussion amongst our, our own team about this. Uh, so we, we haven't seen we haven't seen a lot of uh, updates across the reputation databases yet. I mean, we just we just published, um, you know, we just published all the IOCs like less than a week ago, um, and so I think the information is still kind of trickling out there, and you know, we're slowly starting to work with you know more and more researchers on this too. Uh, so you know, using those as a barometer, uh, not so much. Um, you know, the 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 thing about Sims is they. They need, uh, they take, you know, they, they ultimately, right, they take a lot of data and make it a lot less data. They correlate and put it together. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally oversimplifying here. They do some incredible, you know, incredible uh, analysis, but they do analysis on the data they have. And so ultimately what that means in most cases is they need the alerts. Um, and what we've found, and, you know, I kind of alluded to even in some of the screenshots here, is that most of this activity that we encountered over the past year didn't generate alerts. Um, in fact, uh, I would say basically all of it, because a lot of times that's what you're using uh, network, you know, NDR, network detection and response. That, that is your safety net. That's the last line, right? When the, when the sims miss it, 
when the firewalls miss it, when all the controls miss it, when the, you know, the endpoint clients miss it, the one last place where you can see it and not only, not only investigate it, you know, fully, but actually see it happening is, is on the network. And so that's why, that's why we use this. Um, and so if we're seeing it, that means everything else failed, right? And so that's, that's kind of what we see, see across the board here. So, so those detections, you know, here we are, you know, slightly, just barely less than a week later, um, you know, Sims haven't caught up to that yet. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I expect that that should change over time. Um, but you know, that, that's where we're at today. Thank you.